So what I'm going to be teaching about tonight is um, something that I'll be talking about the components of awakening and some other material. But all of what I'll be talking about is here with us right now. So if you feel moved during my talk, if you want to sit quietly with your eyes closed and just stay close to yourself and see what contacts or what arises in you in response in relation to what I'm saying. So first, I want to give a little talk on awakening, and then we'll do a meditation together, and I'll take some questions. But first, I want to talk about what an awakening experience is. From my perspective and in my teaching and working with students, I identify three components to an experience of awakening. The first is a deep experience of what I call absence of self. And absence, we could also use the word emptiness, so emptiness of self. And this is a felt sense where if I were to ask you right now, who are you? And you would check in, that's what we do to reference who you take yourself to be. If it was absence of self, you would not find a response you would find a kind of a question mark within and your response would be i really don't know who i am and that would be the authentic response and this occurs along the spiritual path generally in relation to meditation that we're doing where we get soft enough that that normal sense of self gets transparent and we begin to see into some aspects of ourselves that are deeper so absence of self is the first quality, first component. The second is seeing clearly our true nature. And by the word, the term true nature, I'm meaning our undivided connection to the source. And in Buddhism, the source is called the absolute. It's called the absolute because it's absolute reality. It's, it's unconditioned. And that means it isn't born, it doesn't die, it's always in existence, it's always been in existence, and it's always here in each of our consciousnesses all the time from birth. So the second component, seeing clearly one's true nature, but also recognizing it as our true identity. So it isn't just seeing it, that's a wonderful experience, a useful experience, but it's the recognition. That's me. That's who I am, or that's what I am. And then the third component is a thoroughgoing unity or love experience. And that would be something like a felt sense of all is one, or everything is the same fabric of oneness. And that has to include us. So it's not just our observation that everything is this unified field of love that includes us. So we're a part, an undivided part of that field of love. And in the materials that talk about awakening, they'll often talk about the depth of the experience. So you'll hear about different teachers in history who had very deep realizations and really what that means is really how how clearly we see true nature as ourself and also how sustained the experience is so for a lot of people a first experience of seeing true nature which many people have had by the way uh, but seeing a first experience would be probably seconds and maybe a little later in one's practice it might be minutes but for a sustained experience, it would generally last days, weeks, even months. So it would really last a long time. And also it would be so thoroughgoing that true nature becomes our foundational identity. 
the sense of self is still here. It's still operating, but it's not grounded in our sense of who we are, our customary self-identity, and all the memories and stories and history we have. We're landed in true nature. We know that's who we are. Even if the personality asserts itself, we never fully believe that that's who we are, even though we have some investment still in it. So the other question is, why isn't everyone awake already if this is so readily available? And the main reason that more people aren't awake is because of the firm conviction in our customary self-identity is who we are at our core. We believe that. We believe this is who I am, this is all that I am, and that I'm doing life on my own. It's my own effort that gets me any kind of success. So we have this idea of being isolated and being our self-identity. And so it's a series of core beliefs, what I call core conceptual convictions about who we are and how the world works that we are so convinced about, we can't even look at the topic. It's so embedded in who we are that it's just an un, unquestionable truth. And for that reason, we don't quite get deep enough to get down and see through that. Because really in the experience of awakening, there gets to be a clarity of perception where the it's like the muddy waters of personality part and we can see deep into the pool of water and see the precious gems that are in the bottom of this pool. So true nature has a lot of qualities. The principal qualities that it has are pure presence, so a beingness, a quality of hereness, like right now in this moment, this is all there is. This is the only time period. So it's a landedness, pure love. And pure love is an amazing feature when we make contact because we all carry uh, a certain idea that we've done uh, bad things. Maybe we're a bad person. Uh, we can also believe on a core level we're, we're unworthy, we're unlovable. Um, you know, you can name all the negatives and somebody holds that opinion of themselves. And so we view ourselves in this way and it's a view of exclusion. And what pure love does when it meets this negative self view is it accepts it, it welcomes it, it embraces it. There isn't really anything that you could do that would exclude you from this pure love. I mean, that's how dynamic and how impactful it is. I've told before on talks where the first few times I made contact with pure love or it was uh, present in my awareness, uh, I wept. I wept because I got to see all the parts of myself that felt like I, I didn't deserve to have contact with pure love. And yet here I was, I was completely immersed in it. So it's, it's just a revolutionary experience for that reason. And then the final component, and these are the core components, is pure awareness. And that means awareness without concept. So it's direct awareness. We're perceiving directly, but we don't have any filtering. We don't have any history or memory that's uh, equating to what it is that we're experiencing. So it's a direct knowing experience. And then the qualities further differentiate, particularly the love, the pure love, differentiates into a variety of things. Uh, innate goodness, which is a meditation we'll practice tonight. Uh, qualities of compassion, joy, um, equanimity, uh, and unconditioned love are all differentiated qualities of our true nature. So the good news is that true nature is a part of our consciousness from birth. 
So we don't have to get anything. We don't have to have anyone give us anything. We simply have to be here and we have to turn in and we have to just stay with that experience. And what we'll be practicing tonight is innate goodness meditation. Innate goodness is a quality of true nature. So it's not something that we have to generate or fabricate uh, or make in any way. It's already here. So really our function is to stay with the meditation so that we slow down and we turn in so that we begin some subtle sensing within because it's discovering the innate goodness that's always here rather than getting it or manufacturing it in some fashion. And that usually is how people meditate. They think they need to make this happen or create it. And that's not what we're doing here at all. So we're gonna be sitting with a quality of our true nature. And from meditation and spiritual practice, our customary sense of self or self-identity gets more and more transparent. We see through it more and more, or the light shines through from the other direction. But that's really the practice of, of spirituality and the function of religion. Now, the way that I see it, there are two, two portals to awakening. The customary, the most customary portal to awakening is through absence of self. And we might call it no self in Buddhism. And this is where we're meditating and the sense of self is getting thinner, more transparent, uh, more pliable, more flexible. And we begin to have moments where we're seeing through, where we're not seeing our customary identity, but we're seeing something that's bigger than that. Because rem rem remember the qualities of the absolute aren't aren't born, they don't die, they're unconditioned. So these qualities are always present. They don't go anywhere. So that's the good news. And the second portal, which is a lesser used portal, but still a valid one is through unconditioned love, through unity. So some people start on the unity side where the oneness of the love, that experience is quite deep and profound. And by staying with that, that will end up opening up to the absence of self. And that will sort of cascade into a first awakening. And that's why uh, tonight we'll be practicing innate goodness meditation. And really because getting in touch with true nature's heart qualities allows us both to steepen those qualities, which is very healing. And it allows us to question and challenge and rewrite some of the negative opinions we have about ourselves. And so we get more and more neutral and that helps feed the process of moving towards uh, an awakening. I, I usually recommend for my ongoing students that they engage with in a goodness meditation daily for 10 or 15 minutes at the start of their meditation period. And then if they want to switch into another meditation, that's perfectly fine. But I think steeping in the innate goodness is so important. That's why I want people to do it on a daily basis or a regular basis. And with my teaching also, there, I believe in learning the meditation. So the on the cushion practice, and really getting established in that it really allows us to steep in these qualities and uh, also i believe in off the cushion practice so for example with any goodness my students when it gets established in them when they're making contact with innate goodness then i have them do that before they go into a public place say they're going into a grocery store just to sit first establish contact with innate goodness and then see what it's like to move through your grocery shopping with innate goodness as being a part of your experience. Now, normally, when we talk about goodness, we also can talk about value. And for most of us in our life, the only times that we 
perceived mirroring about good goodness or being good or whenever we felt we were valued was when we did something when we performed in a way that our caregivers parents partners spouse teachers employers liked when they appreciated and liked your behavior then you were mirrored in your goodness and your value and the problem with that is we conclude from that that i'm only good i only have value when i'm doing something when i'm just sitting here being i don't have any value that's the conclusion we make from this and so this is why this practice is so important because it lets us get in contact with who we really are and also begin to challenge those beliefs about the fact that we don't have goodness we don't have inherent value we get to see that that's not true. And as I mentioned, innate goodness is a quality of each of our true nature. It's also unconditioned, so we don't have to do anything to get it. We don't have to make it or fabricate it in any way. It's here. And in the meditation, I'll give the instructions in a few minutes, but what we're doing is we're really settling down we're turning in and we're paying attention. For most people, it's in the heart area, but for others, it can be elsewhere. We're paying attention to what's here, what's subtle, fresh, uh, can feel like a flowing, a warmth, an okayness. Uh, all those kinds of qualities are used to describe innate goodness. So the benefits of doing the innate goodness meditation I mentioned that we're making contact with the quality of true nature, so that's always a helpful thing. We're also connecting with innate goodness, again, that's unconditioned. And what that does internally is it gives us a sense of buoyancy and resilience. So it lightens our mood, it lightens the heaviness we can carry. And also important, innate goodness has the effect of counteracting the negative self-talk and the negative self-judgments that most people experience. And for most humans, we use self-talk as a way of identifying ourselves to ourselves. So as we move through life, there's that narration, that voice that's expressing all your likes and dislikes. I like those shoes. I don't like that car. I like that building. I don't like that street. So we, we do this constantly, and that's reasserting, reifying who we take ourselves to be. So it's confirming our sense of self. And with innate goodness in our system, that gets lighter. We don't engage in that as much. So that leaves more of our self-identity as a kind of openness rather than a, a settledness, a concludedness in terms of our self-talk. As part of my teaching, when possible, I like to identify the customary resistances to any meditation or any quality of true nature. And there are three resistances or primary resistances to innate goodness. The first I've mentioned is self-talk. And by having that constant reaffirming of who we are, we're sort of keeping the waves on the ocean stirred up. We're not letting the calm water be present. So that definitely is a resistance to innate good, innate goodness, self-judgments. If we're really overly critical of ourselves and everybody has that inner critic or superego, but it's when we really believe it, when we make a mistake and the superego says, that's the dumbest thing you've ever done. Well, first, it's probably not true. I know for me, I've probably done dumber stuff than when the superego asserts itself. But the main point is to question it, to not just accept its pronouncements. It's a whole psychological structure where we, we internalize a caregiver, parent, or some other authority figure when we're in the two to five-year-old age. And 
it's great at the time. It, don't play in the street, don't run with scissors. So really good advice. But as we get to be older and adults, we don't need that kind of sharp criticism to correct us all the time. So it's also something we just don't need in our system. And then finally, probably the strongest resistance to innate goodness is compulsive doing. Most people have that driver that started when we were little. As I mentioned, we were recognized when we, when we performed well, when people um, wanted us to do things and validated us. We, um, we, we got to see that it was our doing that was what was prized. So it starts in us a kind of compulsive doing where you'll notice if you go to sit on the couch, you have a half hour free and you go sit down and most of the time you're sitting there, there's something in you saying, well, you need to do this, you need to do that, look at your list of things to do. So it's sort of pushing, pushing, pushing. And so when we have the compulsive doing going on, we're not settled enough either. So the innate goodness counteracts these resistances, but there is a dynamic tension between them. The innate goodness is a concentration meditation. It's in a certain category of meditations in Buddhism. And the concentration meditation topics, we focus on one meditation object. We're prioritizing it over everything else in our awareness or perception. So this isn't a matter of repressing, it's prioritizing the, the meditative object, in this case, in a goodness. And so the way we do this meditation, if you're a visual meditator, and the way you would know that would be if I told you to close your eyes right now and picture a brick house. If you can see a brick house in your mind's eye, then you're a visual meditator. If I asked you to picture a brick house and you don't have anything, there's just a blankness or something else in your visual field, then you're what I call a, a felt sense meditator. So I'll explain for each group how this meditation works. So both groups are recalling a memory. They're recalling a time either from your lifetime or you're recalling an interaction with another being. And that other being can be an infant, it can be um, a child, a human, it can be an animal. Um, people use nature itself as their meditative object. Uh, some people use idealized figures, the Buddha, Jesus, the Dalai Lama, people like that. So whatever, whatever works for you to have as the memory for innate goodness is perfectly fine. And so what the visual meditator will do is you're picturing being with that other person, being, entity, and you're recalling their exhibiting innate goodness. And you can think a little bit about innate goodness, like sort of like a childlike joy, sort of that exuberant kind of feeling that's unrestrained and just overflowing. And so for the visual meditator, you're picturing being with that infant, the puppy, the, you know, the mountain, the, the lake, whatever, whatever it is that evokes that for you. You're picturing that while you're maintaining your awareness. Uh, as I say, most people, it's the hard area, but it might be different. It is different for a few folks. So find where it is for you, where you're feeling the uh, goodness, the innate goodness of that contact with that other being. And you're holding the picture of the other being uh, while this is radiating in your heart. And so you're just staying with this meditation. Now, when the meditation gets established, meaning you're able to be with the, uh, or able to have the felt sense of innate goodness really strongly for 10 or 15 minutes without serious interruption, you can test by letting go of the memory and shifting awareness directly to innate goodness. And you'll know if it's, if it's the right timing because you'll be able to, to find a way to rest in innate goodness like you would float on top of a pool or a pond. So it's something like that. 
Now, for the felt sense meditator, if you're not a visual meditator, you're doing the same process. You're recalling a memory of being with another being, being with nature itself or an idealized figure, and you are recalling how it felt to be in the field with them. How did their innate goodness feel? So you're making contact with that felt sense by holding the memory. And again, if you can, if you can let it be activated in the heart, that's great. If it's elsewhere, that's fine too. So you're just making contact and the same, the same plan applies. If you get established, if the innate goodness feels stable for 10 or 15 minutes without serious interruption, then try letting go of the memory and resting awareness directly in innate goodness. And again, if it's the timing is right, you'll find that you can float there like you're floating in a pool or pond. Well, this is the time when I'll take questions or comments about what I've spoken about, about the meditation, or oh, you're welcome to share comments about your experience in the meditation if you would like. So if you can um, raise your hands, the automatic hand, then I'll call on you and they'll unmute you. So start with Tom. Thank you for the talk and uh, I'm Buddhist and I listen to Dharma from Thai Mang all the time and I heard the concept of no self. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate more on that? While we have to live our life, we have responsibilities, we have families to take care of. Is it like either all of that or like we can live with right. no self while we are doing that, while we are living our life? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, and first I'll say that we can fully function from a place of absence of self or no self. There isn't, people assume they're going to turn into zombies or be unmotivated. Uh, one of the biggest fears people have about awakening is that they're going to end up where nobody wants to be in relationship with them. They're not going to be able to hold a job. They're going to lose everything and end up virtually homeless. And none of that is true. We become more functional. We become more intimate more connected because we don't have that self that's needing all the time we have, we're con we're in contact with true nature so with reality of who we are so i'd say you know in in my book uh, demystifying awakening i go through the resistances also to awakening which pr principally are fear worry and anxiety so that's common but anyway to have confidence that if there's experience of no self, you can fully function as, uh, in fact, probably function better. Thanks, Tom. Karen? Oh, hi, Stephen. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you in person. I've, I've actually done a Zoom, uh, I've done a self retreat listening to your talks and Tina Rasmussen's talks and mm -hmm. on Samata that was wonderful so it's so nice to um see you in another venue and so i have two questions one if it, from the buddhist perspective could we um exchange the phrase of innate goodness with our buddha nature and then the second question is is more like can you elaborate a little more on what you said about if we're uh if we're visual or not mm -hmm. in terms of the instructions for this meditation again yeah uh, your first question about buddha nature at least the way i use the term i use that to mean the potentiality for each of us to be fully realized the way the buddha was so it's it's a potentiality in that regard i prefer true nature to our most essential identity because it's a little easier to work with and and there's we can differentiate qualities of true nature but like with buddha nature it doesn't give a lot to work with other than kind of a confidence that we can do it so that's how i use the terms and the visual meditators 
is someone who can visualize. So if in this meditation, if I'm a visual meditator, I'm remembering holding one of my children or grandchildren, let's say, and I'm in my mind's eye, I can visually remember and see holding them and see that innate goodness just ex exuding from them. So, but the felt sense meditators can't picture. So they need to remember the, the, the experience, the memory, but contact what it felt like to be with that infant in this example and what it felt like to feel their innate goodness. That makes sense? Yes, and again, the first question was, can we substitute? A Buddha nature for innate goodness. Yes. I, I wouldn't do it myself because I, I think Buddha nature isn't as precise a term. And, and innate goodness is one of the differentiated qualities of true nature. So it, it's not the totality, it's just one, one flavor, one band that's available. There's many, many bands within true nature. But if people want to want to hold it that way, I don't I don't have any problem with that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Barbara. You can unmute, I think, Barbara. There we go. Okay now? Yep. Yeah, so that was very powerful for me. Um, I visualized myself being born and the love that I was surrounded with at the time that was unconditional with no expectations, just pure adoration. And uh, it was very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, my question to you is, uh, I have all these three resistances. But <laughs> In, in welcome, welcome to being human. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any hints about how to quiet the self-judging voice that seems mm -hmm. very strong? Yeah. Well, there's a couple of ways to do that. And um, in my book, I differentiate between people who have suffered what I would say was is an average amount of trauma in their early life versus those that have experienced severe trauma. And people know who they are. If you're a severe trauma person, if you've, in, if you've engaged that or suffered that, you know who you are. So I'll give instructions for each group. So if you had the moderate amount of, of trauma, then the superego can be treated with a certain amount of assertiveness. When that voice is there, that was stupid. You, you have a clear message, stop, back off, not now. And what you're doing is you're creating space because one of the things the superego does is it crowds us. It wants us to recoil and be like a small child. And so when we're like that, it's hard to have our independence and our grounding and our seat, as we might say. So that's why the assertiveness really helps. And if you're a severe trauma person, that won't work. The severe trauma folks, their superegos are really like a superego on steroids. And so what they need to use is love. They need to introduce love, uh, whether it's meta or something else for the superego. And that seems to calm it down and soothe it to where then they can have some space in their inner experience. So those are typically the two ways I recommend to work with it based on who you are. But the innate goodness practice, the meditation, quiets the, the inner critic or superego. Thank you, that's very helpful. You're welcome, sure. Richard. I'm trying to, there. There you go. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I really appreciated it. Sure. Uh, I, um, the innate goodness thing, I, realize I've never had children of my own and that's where most people are most open to feeling an incredible amount of love. Mm -hmm. uh, I seem to not be able to easily get in touch with that feeling but I stumbled upon something uh, some months ago where I found uh, just lying in bed I'm able to recall feeling incredibly joyful okay and i'm wondering if this um 
innate goodness feeling is something like that. It can be mm -hmm. like a memory of feeling incredible joy or in, uh, if possible, incredible love. Is it like a, mm -hmm. a memory you recall? What to, can you say a little more about the joy experience or the memory? Uh, it's something I just, um, it just, uh, you know, I, I somehow uh, fell into it or discovered it that I could feel incredibly joyful and mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be attached to any particular uh, picture or event okay. or anything. It's just, just the feeling of incredible joy. And I could just okay. somehow be able to bring it up. And it was, it's, if I, for the moments when I can be in it, it's just so, such a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Is is it here right now? Um, not in the middle of me conceptualizing it, <laughs> and talking about it, you know. Okay. It's, well, it's, it's wordless, you know. Okay. Well, I'd say for now, Richard, go ahead and uh, take that as your meditative object when it's present and just try to stay with it. So try to rest awareness in it and see what happens because it may be a matter of simply semantics that I'm saying innate goodness, you're saying joy, but the, the quality is really a lightness, a freshness, a buoyancy. So if you're experiencing that kind of uh, attributes, then I, I think that's fine to go ahead and stay with and see. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Diane? <clears throat> Um, hi, I'm sorry I can't have my video on today. Thank you so much for um, your talk and your and the space to um, cultivate this um, awareness of innate goodness. I I was grateful that I I was struggling to um, remember something or someone, and then I remembered. Um, I had the privilege of um, being in the presence of the Dalai Lama mm -hmm. for a, a presentation. And I was like, for the next, gosh, I don't know, weeks, I was vibrating at such a high level. I was so infused with that man's joy. And he, I kept saying joy, he was a joyful storyteller. And, I, and anyway, so I was thinking of that, but I realized you, you did, mention heart and most people um, are focused in the heart and so for a lot of this sitting time I was in my mind remembering that and the feelings of that and then I did all of a sudden remember oh to take it into my heart so so I think because of the you know I, I was imagining that experience and the room and the energy um, that it was in my mind. So could you mm -hmm. say a little more, you know, um, do I, do I want to feel it in my heart? Do I want to see it in my heart? I don't know if it's clear my question. I felt like I, oh, I, I, I wish I had stayed with my heart longer based on right. what you said. Yeah, no, I think that sounds fine. Uh, we do recall the memory typically in our mind, but as much as possible, you want your awareness to be in the heart area if that's not uncomfortable for you. And so that's where you want to feel that joy is normally in the heart area. Again, not everybody feels it that way, but you want to see where else it is in your body other than your head. Because it's a little, a little better when you have direct contact with it bodily rather than, than just head, just concept or memory. But, but I think you're on to, that's a good memory to use. And just try and hold, if you can, hold the memory and your awareness in the heart, if that's possible. That's the ideal positioning. Thank you. I'll do that. Thank you. Okay. I'm glad I asked. Good. Appreciate Me too. It. Auntie, no name. Yes. Um, I had a, a question with regard to, uh, because tonight experience, I seem to, I'm trying to lower my hand, oops, 
um, oops, I raised it. Uh, is, is innate goodness, do you find that it's interconnected to other textures? Like I had this experience um, in connecting with the heart and connecting with innate goodness. Then it was almost like this journey occurred. And there was a moment where I was experiencing my non-self where I just like, I just found myself laughing and mm -hmm. just went into this st a state of consciousness. And then beneath that, I, I just experienced this beautiful floral incense of essence. And then deeper within that was this profound sense of the profoundly um, sacred. And mm -hmm. when I feel that connection, it's not only the heart, but I feel it in my solar plexus and I feel it in my gut, sort of where the seat of uh, intuition is. But then I, I would okay. uh, bring myself back to to what the task was of sort of the innate con uh, goodness. And I wonder if you could maybe speak to the interconnectedness and also maybe for severe or extreme trauma survivors, if it's possible to maybe heal and mend the root, because I in the meditation, I was shown sort of some of the root of what me, blocks me from being able to access innate goodness. And once mm -hmm. that is mended, if that super ego sort of kind of quiets a bit more. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, well, to me, there's sort of two parts to your question. And one is the meditation itself. And um, I, I suspect that you probably have experience in like the shamanic tradition. Would that be right? Yeah, I figured. Um, so the, the, the journeying part is a part of your tradition or at least your background. And so that's gonna be particular to you. Um, but I separate out the meditation, like the being with the innate goodness or that kind of heart quality from what I call investigation. And the investigation would be more the journeying. I, I do that at a separate time and say, this is investigation time. And then I'll, I'll explore and I'll, I'll look and I'll make notes and all this kind of stuff. So I, I think it works better for me to do it that way, rather than if I'm investigating the meditation, I end up doing more investigation and less just being with the, the heart quality. So I'd say, see if you can differentiate those, but I, but I think you're onto it completely and you are gonna see that by being with innate goodness, one of the benefits is it percolates up whatever our resistances are or whatever's not, let's say harmonious with it. So, and not that we've got to fix everything in our life, but we fix what's obvious and what we can. You know, we may have things that are too painful to fix or they're too complicated. And we put those aside. Maybe later we'll get back to those. But work with the stuff you can. That's the main thing. But it sounds good. It sounds like you're onto it. Thanks, Barbara. Hi. Hi. Um, this this was so beautiful. I'm so grateful for the, these teachings. And yeah, it's so fascinating because my question um, flows from the previous uh, question. I experienced this flow of innate goodness from one image one memory to another unfolding into another and it moved quite beautifully and i'm wondering if the teaching is such that there's more um helpfulness to maintaining a focus of one you know of one, one memory exactly yeah no, you know, some people are able to do that to hold a memory for the meditation and other people are not, they mm -hmm. need to shift memories and that's fine to do. But the main thing is you want to try to have the majority of your awareness with innate goodness and the yeah. minority in contact with the memory, whatever memory it is. But just notice, and, and we'll notice if our, if our self-identity is trying to co-opt the meditation, where it'll be like channel surfing. It'll want to keep changing memory, changing memory, changing. And, but you want to land for a while yeah. and kind of feel like you're steeping in it. And then if you want to move on, it, it feels kind of like we, we've, we've wrung it out, you know, and then it's a good time to move on. But just notice that that line on how much is is naturally occurring and is there some part of you that's impatient or wants to change or yeah. is bored or something like that. 
No, it wasn't that. It, it was really quite beautiful. And I just also want to really acknowledge, I've never heard anybody speak to the issue of trauma. Mm -hmm. And I've struggled at times. And you're the first um, person that I've really heard something that feels very powerful. Mm -hmm. And I can, I, I've experienced the difference Good. exactly in the way that you've established that. And one last thing that I'd like to share in my own personal experience, <clears throat> I'm a visual artist at this point, and mm -hmm. I, I've said to people over the years, I have no visual memory. So it's been fascinating. I was also a dancer, so I'm very kinesthetic and very mm -hmm. feeling, um, my perception of feeling is very strong. I've learned where those two can meet. So I'm just wondering if as people learn this process, there's more fluidity to our perceptual capabilities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because for most people, we're observing the surface of the ocean. And with these practices, we're staying with the surface, but we're letting it settle. And then we're starting to descend into the still water. So yeah however it works for you everyone's different it unfolds yeah. differently but the main thing is just you want to try to have your awareness be in contact with innate goodness mm -hmm. because it's really steeping in that that again affords us a buoyancy and resilience and also puts us in direct contact with our true nature so we start to counteract all those you know the fears and the nervous and the anxiety stuff it counteracts it by reality because we say, okay, I was in there for 10 minutes and nothing bad happened. So I know at least 10 minutes is safe. Next time it's 15 minutes. Okay, well, that was safe too. So we're, we're sort of titrating our experience, but we're building our trust. That's the main thing that we have to do. And then we can come back to these things. And there's a whole host, as I mentioned, of qualities of true nature that we can work with and differentiate that that'll be a later book i'm working on now It'll be out next uh -huh. year probably um just thank keeps you. unfolding <laughs> but anyway yeah. yeah thanks for your question i appreciate that thank you yes elanise am i saying that right oh good you can go ahead and unmute hi uh thank hi. you so hi. much i really appreciate that you're talking and uh, I just wanted to share something about mm -hmm. my meditation, my experience, and then I have a question. Okay. Um, was I found it interesting because uh, I had a lot of resistance to see the good, the goodness, to connect with the goodness, because I always relate the goodness in myself with the things that I do. Right. So, I try to, to connect with love. I don't know if there is any difference between these two. I think there is no difference between these two. But what's interesting that I needed to work with the goodness, uh, even though I tried to connect with love, was, mm -hmm. I don't know, some way was easy for me to feel like my true nature is love, then the goodness. I found, well, mm -hmm. wow, I needed to do some investigation. And uh, so the question, it's related to the self, no self. Uh, what's the difference between to feel uh, the, no, the no self and the, uh, the health ego? Because uh, no self would be no ego. And mm -hmm. how, because I heard a lot about the, to, to cultivate the importance of uh, cultivating the healthy ego. So mm -hmm. could you like elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, yeah, and, and that's a good question. We, we actually need a fairly healthy ego if we're going to transcend the ego. So the people who have had life events where the ego isn't as stable for whatever reason, again, it's not a fault of theirs, it's just the life experience. They normally would wanna work with therapy or some other modality that helps them get more clear about who they are. And like with the students I have that also are, are people who are fluid in terms of transgender or, or sexual orientation, I really encourage them to really be clear about that because for the same reason, 
we have to know who we are in order to be able to open up to something bigger of who we are. And if we're uncertain of that or it's unclear, it's a lot harder to do. So that is an important aspect. And I think, going back to your, your comment, I think it's fine to make contact with love. That That's the, love is the viscosity of life. All life force, all, all manifestation is powered by love. But what we're doing here with any goodness is we're, we're differentiating a quality of love, which is innate goodness. It's a little bit different than just the love, but it's perfectly fine if you make contact with the love and you really let yourself steep in it. That's what's important, to really let it steep, to help counteract all those beliefs and all these self-opinions we have that are outdated. Yeah, thanks for your question. Okay, uh, Richard. Uh, I'm wondering if we have any additional questions. Could, could we email you or do anything like sure. that? Sure, sure, that's fine. Um, my email is uh, awakeningdharma at yahoo.com. Okay, thank and you very much. It's also my website, Awakening Dharma. <laughs> so it works that way. So anyway, I wanna thank you all for being here. Uh, thank Rick and his team. I really enjoyed being here with all of you, and I really appreciate your meditation and your questions and comments, and uh, wish you all very well till the next time we see each other. I hope you enjoyed that talk. I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free.